Welcome to the Darren Woodson Show. Our guest today, I'm a little excited about this one, is Greg Everett, who is the founder of Catalyst Athletics. And I'm a meathead. I was going to say, this, <laughs> this is 100%. <laughs> Greg does a little bit of lifting. Yeah. And uh, he's also the author of the book, Becoming Tough. Uh, great book that he wrote. Um, but before we get to Greg, mm-hmm. Tyler, why don't you tell us about today's sponsor? We are really excited about the partnership Ooh. that we've got with In Good Taste. Darren and I just recently did an event with them uh, surrounding the draft, but got to drink some of their wine, yeah. go through the whole process. We actually had uh, the the CEO and founder, co-founder of What's the company. Joe's last, I can't remember Joe's last name. Joe, Joe was, was awesome. I mean, yeah. so edgy. it's so funny because literally I didn't expect it. Right. Because he's just a guy's guy. Yeah. And then he starts talking about wine. And boom, so boom, 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 so boom. Joe's a former athlete, yep. former football player, played yep. at, the, uh, at Stanford University. Yep. Yep. But now he's talking wine. And Joe totally, like, all the way informed us and gave us wisdom on wine. Yes. Just right there in person. We were talking football, but he was talking wine. And we were like, okay, we're intrigued. And talked about in good taste. Uh, the package is seven or eight wine bottles, small wine bottles. You get to actually do the tasting instead of going out and buying the, and purchasing a, a big wine bottle that you know nothing about. But uh, not only do you do you have the wine tastings and the sommeliers and all the coaching, but the virtuals as well. Yes. So if you own a business, small business owner or big business owner, you can do virtual wine tastings uh, online. You can uh, have your family members go on virtually and do wine tasting with In Good Taste. Just a fabulous time. With yeah, these guys. it's it's an education. It's a sampling. It's uh, an events. Yeah. I mean, they, they do everything. And it is a great, great company. We had a great time when yeah. we went through it. We're going to do more with them. But make sure to check them out, ingoodtaste.com. Check it out. Buy some for your employees. Yeah. Buy some for your family. Do these virtual wine tasting events. Learn about wine. Love wine. And have great conversation. Right. Enjoy the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in. <laughs> Welcome to the Darren Woodson Show. Our guest today is Greg Everett. Greg is the founder of Catalyst Athletics, which is a world, which is the world's leading resource of educational material for Olympic weightlifting. He's also the author of the book Tough: Building True Mental, Physical, and Emotional Toughness for Success and Fulfillment. And the reason we found Greg, or the way we found Greg, actually was through listeners. And Greg reached out to us. You, I believe you had said to Darren that you had a bunch of your followers that said, hey, we, we've heard the Darren Woodson show. We think you'd be a great guest on that. Um, so definitely pretty cool way that, yeah. that, that we found each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I reached out and, and said, hey, you know, what do you guys listen to? You know, what would you like to hear me on? And your show came up a number of times. And so I'm glad you guys actually were willing to have me on. Yeah, wow. no, it's awesome. Yeah. We're, we're excited, man. It, you know, obviously we see the big following on Instagram and, and things like that, but what we want to understand is how you got here and catalyst athletics. I mean, it's one of the biggest, and, and like the, the intro said, the world's leading resource for weightlifting. So we want to understand though, cause we know you didn't just pop down on earth and, and start the company. We want to understand how you got here. So where are you from? What was family life like growing up? Talk to us a little bit about that. So I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, South Bay. Um, I mean, no one everywhere else says Silicon Valley, dead center. Mm. Uh, my dad was there because he was a, a aerospace engineer. And so in the 60s, you know, he finished, he went, he was a total propeller head. He went to MIT and then Stanford to get his PhD. Um, meanwhile, of course, I went to Chico State. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, buddy. But, uh, <laughs> So I'm the I was going to say, man, the apple, the, the apple just usually falls close to the tree, man. The, the, the apple tree was on a hill. It, hit it just rolled. Yeah. It was on a hill. Isaac Newton saw that one coming. But uh, so he, he was out there from the 60s on. And, and uh, so I grew up there. And it, it, this was obviously way before the, the uh, Internet technology and all those companies were there. So a very different place. Mm-hmm. Um my parents split when I was real young, uh, five years old, I think. And I ended up uh, primarily living with my mom. And that was not because I didn't have a good relationship with my father necessarily. It was more that he was the strict one and I couldn't get away with as much. And I knew that even at a young age. And so 
I, I stuck around old mom's place and I probably shouldn't have, I was doing yeah. things I shouldn't have been doing, but, um, that was the route I chose. And so, you know, get through school, um, as awkwardly as possible. And it was one of those weird times where, you know, I, I was always a popular kid, but it wasn't because I was secure in myself or necessarily happy about it. It was more because I was very good at, uh, being whoever I needed to be in the moment. Mm. Right. So I, I was very good at recognizing what people were looking for and, and becoming that. Um, so I kind of stumbled my way through my formative years and bolstered with a, a, a medically unsafe amount of recreational drug use to help out. And um, when I, you know, this, this entire time that, you know, one of the interesting dilemmas of my life was I'm sitting here using a lot of drugs, doing all this stuff, drinking, you know, hanging out with, with uh, questionable folks. Uh, but I always had this affinity for sports and training. And so, you know, I played, you know, just about every traditional sport, you know, of, and, um, was a competitive bicycle trials rider, which is a really obscure sport. Uh, you know, I was a rock climber, I was a backpacker, you know, doing all these different things. Um, and I was always drawn very much to the training and preparation side of things. So no matter what sport I was in the gym side of things or the field, you know, prep side of things was probably more appealing to me than the sport itself in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the, the common thread throughout those years. And so I became a personal trainer when I was 18 and didn't enjoy that too much simply because of that environment. You know, you're in kind of the big box gym and it's more counting reps and, and yep. telling people that their, you know, their food journals look terrible than <laughs> uh, anything super rewarding. Like, Hey, yeah. You, you know why you're not losing any weight is because you're drinking an entire bottle of red wine every night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> And not writing it down in that. Sounds like you, Darren. Had to, yeah, had to well, pull having to that out of you. Talk them off the elliptical out. machine. Like, why isn't this working? Yeah, I think this one's broken. Um, and so I got I got very lucky a number of years later, and I, I was living in Chico, and and through a, a really odd collection of relationships, I ended up meeting a guy named Rob Wolf. Um, who is now, you know, his best-selling author of the Paleo Solution, Sacred mm -hmm. Cow, a number of nutrition books. And he had just opened up um, a CrossFit gym, uh, sharing space with a Brazilian jiu-jitsu studio. So this was a tiny little space in the back. No one knew what CrossFit was back then. You know, now, of course, it's ubiquitous. But um, so I started training with him, and I had been in, introduced to the sport of Olympic weightlifting in a sense during high school, you know, 15, 16 years old, you know, reading uh, Charles Polican's old book, Polican principles, and, and just mm -hmm. seeing little pieces of it here and there, but was never sure what it was. Uh, you know, there were no coaches around that I knew of, um, you know, years later, of course, I found out that Jim Schmitz, who was, you know, the most dedicated or uh, decorated weightlifting coach in this country was 45 minutes North of me in mm. South San Francisco, but this is, you know, pre Google era. So yeah. I can't just type in weightlifting coach near me. Mm. <laughs> uh, so I had no idea. So I kind of figured my way through that as well as I could. And, uh, but once I met Rob, I ended up in a facility where, you know, he had some bumper plates. He had a bar that actually spun fairly mm. well, you know, relative to the stuff I was using in my garage and there was rubber on the floor so you could drop right. weights. And so it, it kind of rekindled this interest for me in weightlifting and in the sport. And uh, through that, I, I met Mike Bergner, who was a, a really well-established uh, Olympic weightlifting coach. And I basically sweet talked my way into moving down to Southern California to train under him and, um, you know, mentored under him as a coach. And he was just, you know, not just a really knowledgeable guy, but extremely generous with his time and his, mm. his knowledge and, uh, you know, really took me under his wing. And, uh, you know, that's how I became a coach is just, you know, this series of really uh, fortunate interactions with people that were not necessarily sought out. Uh, but that I would, I really found opportunities and took advantage of them as quickly as I could, because I knew that they weren't going to stick around. Right. Uh, and so I just, you know, another fortunate part of it was that I got into it at a time when there was nothing going on online with regard to the sport of weightlifting. I mean, there were maybe two websites, there was no information, uh, you know, even USA weightlifting or, or international weightlifting federation just had nothing. There was nothing instructional. There was no way for someone like me as a kid to go learn, how do you snatch? How do you clean and jerk? How do you compete? 
uh, it's just this big black hole. And so I chose to fill that hole, even though I was questionably qualified at that time. Um, and it, it turned out to be the right thing to do because, you know, here I am now. And this book that I wrote in 2008 is in the third edition. It's, mm. uh, you know, the best selling on the topic out there and, uh, you know, continues to really reach all over the world and help a lot of people out get into the sport. Uh, because there still is really limited access to coaching. It's not like football or something where, you know, you've got the Pop Warner organization and, and uh, you know, school teams where it's it's very easy. Hey, I'm interested in that sport. I'm going to go, you know, try out and or, you know, pay my fees for the the club teams or whatever. Uh, you've really got to work hard to find this stuff and, and find a way to make it happen. So, yeah, I know so we I had just Matt, was lucky. We had Matt Frazier on um, a few months ago. And it was a very similar story. He lucked into, because his dad was talking to a coach at his high school about weightlifting. And yeah. there was an Olympic coach. What It was like two towns over. Yeah, it was like yeah. 40 minutes away. So he would drive over to this town. that There was an Olympic lifting coach. And, and same deal. It was just by luck that he fell yeah. into it. I mean, can you imagine if CrossFit nowadays didn't have Matt Frazier? Yeah. If he didn't find him? Because, I mean, they're just the resources were different. Yeah. Well, Matt was a really, really talented junior weightlifter. I mean, he was a, a resident at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs for a while until he got injured. And so you look at that and it's like, you know, how much how much phenomenal talent is out there yeah. totally untapped yeah. because those opportunities don't exist. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's go back to, to your childhood and growing up a little bit. Do you remember when you were a kid, were you a mentally tough kid or or physically tough kid? You know, because there's some kids that come up and you just know, like, that kid is strong as shit. Like, he just yeah. has something about him. Were you that that guy? Uh, mentally, yes. Physically, in ways. So I remember, you know, as a kid, I was small. I was skinny. I was short. Uh, and you know, and now I'm 41 years old. Now I'm six feet and 215 pounds. You know, I lifted as a heavyweight. So walked around at 235. Goodness. So I'm a large ish guy. Um, although anytime I've, I've hung out with any NFL players, I feel like I'm a different species of human <laughs> being. Like, I don't know what planet you guys come from. But hey, I played just, for six years and I felt there. the same way. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, it's like John Wellborn is a friend of mine and, and mm. standing next to him, he's just like, God, oh, I feel like bad. a child. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so, I, you know, I, and I remember I, I grew up with uh, just one kid who stood out, man, uh, this guy, Danny, who was this like just burly Irish kid, you know, big Irish Catholic family, uh, Navy dad, you know, who's got 16 big brothers or whatever it was. And I just remember him, you know, playing football with him or playing kill the pill, whatever we were doing. And he was just this, piece of rock where you would come sprinting into him full speed and he wouldn't move and you would go flying off the other mm -hmm. direction. So I, I always felt inferior in that sense physically. Um, but I was always pretty athletically capable. So I mm -hmm. was quick, you know, I was agile, I had all these other skills. Uh, I just didn't have this, the, the size and, and the absolute strength, but mentally I, I did always feel like I had this ability where I, I wasn't, worried about ever uh, not being able to handle something I would encounter. In other mm -hmm. words, I, I kind of felt from very early on that, you know, whatever it is, I'll deal with it. I'll handle it. It might be miserable, but I'll figure a way out uh, or figure a way through it. So I did have that going for me early on. And I think that's kind of what propelled me to where I am now is, mm -hmm. is that willingness to kind of put up with inconvenient things, difficult things. Um, and rather than kind of you know, throw up my hands in frustration is like, well, dig in and how can I make this work for me? Or, or what yeah, am I yeah. going to do in response? Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a valuable characteristic. I did not have that characteristic growing up at all. We've, we've talked about it in the past on this show. I was very much a, if it got uncomfortable, if it got difficult, I was going to shy away. So for you to say that you were the opposite of that, that's a, that's a very admirable, especially as a young kid to be able to well, be that way. And admittedly, it wasn't across the board though. So it, it was, I was very much like a loner, independent kid. You know, I didn't have a close relationship with my family. Uh, my sister was out of the house early. So I was kind of just uh, essentially a latchkey kid, but, but, you know, 50% by choice, 50% by circumstance, you know, mm -hmm. that's just kind of how I, I operated. 
Um, and so I think that was a big part of it is, is that sense of independence and self-reliance and like, well, if I want something done, I'm going to do it myself and I'm mm-hmm. still that way. Uh, and so I think that was a, a huge underpinning of that sense that, Hey, you know, I'm able to do all these things on my own. So why can't I do this over here? But at the same time, I had this just like crippling insecurity um, and, and self-consciousness to the point where, uh, you know, even up to, I remember being, you know, like 19 years old, I lived in Arizona for a while, went to school there briefly. And I would run out of food sometimes because I, the anxiety of going to the grocery store would keep me in my house. Um, Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, I look back at that now and I'm like, I just, I can't even remember exactly what that was like because it's, it's so much better now. Um, You know, I have been given weightlifting seminars for the past 10 plus years and I'll spend two days by myself speaking in front of a big crowd and I compare those two experiences and Gosh. it's like, well, that's about the, you know, the, the biggest change you can make. Polar opposite. Yeah. 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 Talk, talk to us a little about the, when you say I had in, too much anxiety to go to the store, what do you mean by that? I mean, literally if I walked into a room, uh, my automatic assumption was that everybody was looking at me and mm. picking out what they didn't like about me, what mm. the problem was. So, um, and I, you know, I think about it now as an adult and I'm like, well, how absurd, how presumptuous, like no one cares, <laughs> right. right? No one's that interested in you. But it, it, so it wasn't, it wasn't that sense of like conceit where it's like, yeah, everyone's checking me out. It was like, oh my God, like everybody's looking at me. Like, is there something on my face? You know, do I look funny? Yeah. Are my arms big enough? Like yeah. anything huh. you could think of. Was yeah. that a short uh, period uh, of the time? shirt is stupid. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> was- no, it was... I mean, it was from as young as I can remember to, you know, probably early twenties is, is when it started, I started really actually doing something about it, you know, and figuring out ways to combat it, uh, as a young adult. And I think that's why I was such a, uh, had such a drug problem is cause that was the easy way, mm-hmm. you know, socially interacting with people is that's a great excuse. You know, if, if you, if you're stumbling around like a moron and, and saying stupid things and looking ridiculous, well, yeah, of course I am. Look at what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, versus being a normal kid uh, who's doing those same things and, and, you know, making whatever silly mistakes that you, or you believe you're making silly mistakes. You don't have an excuse for it. Right. So you mentioned that you, you lived with your mom most of the time. What was your relationship with like, what was it like with your dad through that time? I mean, was he in the same town? I mean, you said he was strict. Yeah. So, so he, he, it was interesting. So my parents split, they, I mean, they were wonderful people and I give them so much credit for dealing with me cause I was a hellion, but, <laughs> um, they were very good about staying close by. I mean, they lived five minutes away from each other. You know, mm-hmm. I could ride my skateboard between the two houses. Um, and that was very much an intentional choice on their part. And they, they wanted to make it as, as um, you know, convenient as possible and keep it as, you know, reduce the awkwardness as much as possible. But there was definitely some acrimony between the two of them, uh, which is obvious to any kid. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with my dad, it was always a, sort of a distant relationship. I, we were never really close. And it was, it was always one of those things where I always had that, um, I don't want to say anger toward him, but it was more like I was frustrated because he was so strict and I felt like he didn't, you know, it's, it's the, the typical, you know, 15 year old kid. Yeah. My dad doesn't understand he me, doesn't you know, know. Yeah. Uh, you know poor me and he doesn't understand why I have a nose ring and all this and I ride a skateboard and I'm an asshole Uh, (laughs) but you know simultaneously always really really wanting his approval and to to feel like he was proud of me so it was again this constant dilemmas where you you have this total contradiction in you know what you're doing and the way you're behaving and, and what you're striving for so it's like you know, I would go through periods of time where I would do really well in school. Um, and I, fortunately I was a relatively smart kid, so I didn't have to work too hard to do mm-hmm. that. But, uh, and then there were times where I just couldn't be bothered. You know, I, I would, I remember I would skip school all the time to go to work. I worked at a bike shop all through high school. And mm-hmm. my boss was one of those guys who was like, aren't you supposed to be in school? And I would just say, no. And then it would, everything would be fine. Yeah. You know, it's it's a Tuesday work. at so, 10 a.m. It's a holiday. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so talk to us a little bit about that dynamic you just mentioned, and, and Darren's mentioned this as well, that the the competing interest with a father's affection. Um, as I get older, and I don't say this braggadocious at all, I, I was fortunate to have both of my parents in the home and, and a very supportive and loving father. So I'm very always curious about people that didn't necessarily have their father in the home. And so you yeah. mentioned, you know, it was a competing interest of, well, he, he's too strict, but I still want to impress him. So yeah. let's dig a little bit deeper into that and that dynamic and, and what was going on, for, you know, through that. So I don't know entirely the source of it, but he was a very, he was a very accomplished guy. Like I said, he got, he had a, a bachelor's and master's from MIT in aeronautics and astronautics and then got a PhD from Stanford. Mm. Um, and then, you know, he worked for Lockheed. He was on the team that um, created the original space shuttle proposal mm -hmm. to NASA, Goodness. which was just too ahead of its time. Uh, you know, they didn't get around to actually accepting the idea of, of, of a reusable space vehicle till much later. Um, and so they, it was just very high bar. Uh, at least intellectually. And, you know, he was also an athletic guy. You know, he grew up in back East, you know, New Jersey, Detroit, um, you know, playing ice hockey and, and basketball and baseball and all these things. So uh, it, it, I think it was one of those things where, again, that sense of insecurity that I had generally, mm -hmm. I was always comparing myself to other people and feeling like I was mm -hmm. falling short. And so, um, you know, seeing that, that high bar, but then also, sensing or at least believing that there was this feeling of kind of disappointment or disapproval on his, his end because I was this, you know, little rascal, you know, riding the skateboard, causing trouble, um, didn't care too much about school, all these sorts of things. And, and I, th I think that that was, um, it, it was always a difficulty for me because I think you know, look, looking back, at least retrospectively, I think I, I definitely needed that good male figure in my life, you know, for that role model, which I didn't really have. And all credit to my mom. I mean, she was a great mother. She worked hard for me. Um, but it's not the same. You yeah. know, it's not the same as having a father figure or some kind of role model in that sense. And I think that was a big part of why I had to kind of independently seek out these things that I felt were challenging and difficult and um, you know, I don't want to say masculine necessarily, but I'm sure there was a sense that that's what it was at yeah. that time, because I, that was probably missing in my life, you know, raised by my mom. I just had an older sister. Uh, she wasn't around much, but that was what I was surrounded by was women. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that now because I coach primarily women and I, I, you know, I have a wife, I have a daughter. Uh, and so I think it's given me a, a great amount of perspective on, on, you know, people in general and, and interacting with people and, and all these different things. But certainly that was, that was probably a big issue for me growing up is not having that, that role model. Was there anything that you did that you can remember like, okay, I actually got the approval or I got the attention from my dad that I was, I, you know, that battle that I was looking for. Was there any specific, was it school? Was it, was it sports? Was it just behaving? What was it? I think I started seeing more and more of it later in life, like towards the end of high school, getting into college. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think the first time that I, I really noticed it that I can remember is when I did go to college for the, the first of my three colleges, <laughs> you know, when I first went and it was kind of like, I think there was this big sense of relief on his part where he's like, ah, oh, he's going to college. Oh, not yeah. jail. This is he crazy. actually did it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, I, like I said, you know, I was always an athletic kid and I, I was fairly good at the things I did. So I, I do believe that there was an appreciation of that and a recognition of that on his part. But it, again, we were not very communicative yeah. about it. So it's not like yeah. he would sit me down like, yeah, proud of you, son. It was kind of like there's that real subtle wink and nod yeah. sort of thing. And you kind of have to be looking for it. Yeah. Um, but definitely later in life, you know, once I became an adult and you know, I started my own company and I was writing books and doing all these things, he became more and more expressive about that. And he really wouldn't, you know, explicitly say, Hey, I'm proud of you. But it was like, he was always 
telling other people about yeah. what I was doing. Yeah. 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 So, and that was a big thing. Yeah. For me. From a, from a career path, right. You, you mentioned in, in high school, you found late in high school, you found this weightlifting, you know, this passion for it, or, or even uh, Chico or whatever uh, in college. But when you started it, did you immediately think, okay, hey, this is a career I want to pursue? Or was it, no. hey, I'm, I'm going to do it because I just love doing it? Yeah, it was never in a million years that I think I could turn this into a career. And, you know, the landscape has changed so much just in the past 10 years, let alone in the past, you know, 25 since that. Um, you know, you look back. So I, I actually co-owned the fourth CrossFit affiliate gym in the world with Rob Wolf. Wow. So... This is, you know, you open a CrossFit gym. Now you have instant clientele. Yeah. They will come through your doors and beg you to take their money. When we started this gym in 2003 or whatever it was, we were like holding people at gunpoint and practically paying them <laughs> to come train with us. You know, it's like they would, they would roll in on a brand new Trek road bike, three grand wearing full Patagonia head to toe and yeah. complain about our price, which was yeah. like you know, 55 bucks a month, yeah. a month or something. And we're like, we'll cut it in half, you know, whatever you need. Uh, and so back then the, the idea that I could tell people how to lift weights and earn a living, not just and support myself, but support two other human beings. Mm -hmm. Never in a million years would I have imagined it was possible. So no, it never crossed my mind. It was, uh, you know, I, I I probably assumed back then it was just something I was going to do as a recreation, you know, because uh -huh. I loved training. I loved getting stronger and quicker and all these things. So then you get you get the mentor uh, and Mike was it Mike Bergner, right? And yep. so so you get him, and then it it. it escalates is that when it turned to like okay the light switch kind of clicked now that i see the opportunity i see the gap but i mean yeah. it, what was the gap from meeting rob to mike and and going down to southern california so when i went i went down there in early 2006 i think and so at that point crossfit was kind of starting to pick up a little steam so it was it was becoming more evident that this was a possible way to earn money, at least mm -hmm. owning a gym. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I sold my share of the gym back to Rob and, and his now wife, Nikki. Um, and I bought out the online journal that we had started. So we kind of just basically made a, a, a trade on that. Yeah. And I'm still publishing that thing 16 years later. Um, and which is like, it's like having 16 years of homework that never ends. <laughs> um, <laughs> But so at, at that point, it wasn't quite, it wasn't lucrative still to have a CrossFit gym necessarily. There were a couple gyms out there who were doing her well. I think like Andy Petranik down in LA was doing pretty well, but you know, that, that's a very specific uh, demographic down there. You got a lot of people with disposable income and a lot of spare time. Yeah. Um, we're very different from most towns where you're trying to run a gym. And so going down to Bergner's was this break and I was doing personal training on the side, you know, out of his garage, again, generous guy. And he wouldn't let me pay him for the space or anything. So I was earning money that way. I was doing online stuff. I was building websites for extra money. So I was yeah. doing a bunch of odd jobs to kind of pay the bills while I did this weightlifting thing. Um, but it became clear within that first couple of years that I probably wasn't going to the Olympics. Um, you know, I started too late. I wasn't necessarily naturally perfectly suited for this sport. Um, but it was becoming more and more evident at the same time that I was pretty good at helping other people get better at mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, I was, I was very good at communicating these ideas and, and, and um, you know, helping people do what they were trying to do. And so that was kind of a natural transition, I think, even if it wasn't a conscious thing where this is what I want to do long-term, you know, in 15 years, this is what I'm going to be doing. Um, and then it really started because, I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, there was just nothing online about this stuff. You couldn't go and learn like, Hey, right. how do I do a snatch? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to fill that gap. And so initially I went to Bergner and I said, Hey, you need to write a book because the books that are out there are just no good. Like I tried to learn how to do these lifts as a kid. There's just nothing out there that, that makes any sense. That's helpful. Um, and so I literally ghost wrote an entire book for him to sign off on. And then as we were getting toward the end, it was kind of like, yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I really want to do this. And so I was like, well, what do you I'm mean? I've already done gonna... all the work. What are you <laughs> yeah, talking about? I'm not going to just not write this book. Yeah. Right. 
And so, you know, I had written that book with all of his approach, you know, his progressions, learning progressions, all that stuff. So I basically rewrote the whole thing, same kind of structure and format, but with my own original, uh, Mm. you know, learning progressions and things like that. And so I I think that, you know, I, I, I never would have had, uh, I never would have thought that I could put a book out like that at that stage because I wasn't an accomplished coach Mm -hmm. at all. I mean, I was barely an established coach. So it was, it was this very presumptuous thing. And it, it always kind of worried me that I was going to just get annihilated by these, these really great coaches. But fortunately it turned out to be a good book. And I got a lot of support from these, these older coaches. Um, and I think it was because I always just approached it very respectfully. You know, I, I really appreciated the, the sense of lineage and legacy you know, you look at like the martial arts world and, and people were like, yeah, I learned from so-and-so who learned from right. this guy and you can trace it back. Yeah. Uh, and there's always this, this gratitude and this recognition of people who came before you. And I, I went that same way and I still try to today. Um, and so I think that really helped kind of establish me uh, and, and s- let people, you know, who are already really involved in the sport know that I wasn't just some new kid who was trying to take over and pretend I knew everything and, and, uh, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel. I was just kind of trying to continue and help more people. So so the one of the questions I do have for you is, is as you were training and competing, did you feel like you were the the type that was very, you know, attention to detail oriented and were you a technician when you were going through the process? hundred percent. And the funny thing is that my coach, Mike Bergner was not like that at all. Um, he was very, you know, so he, he went, he played on the national championship football team at Notre Dame in the Mm sixties. Um, and so, you know, father Lang was their strength coach when they bench press, it was literally a wooden bench and they like pulled it out of the park and then loaded it up. And, you know, they were doing, they were benching in, uh, in wrestlers bridges, like 300 pounds, like just ridiculous stuff. Cause back then you could just spear people, right. You know, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, the, the good old days. Uh, <laughs> they were also feeding everybody Diana ball, but uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's another, that's well, another we topic. Know, we don't really know what this is. We just know that when we give it to you guys, you're really fast and really strong yes. and a little hairy. <laughs> don't uh, worry about those other things. As long as you play better, <laughs> you know, you worry about that in 30 years. Yeah. But uh, it, so he was, he was very, very different. So I, I learned so much from him and primarily what I learned from him though is, is, you know, how to interact with your lifters. It's, it was more the behavior and the kind of the leadership sort of qualities mm-hmm. versus the technical aspect of things, which um, I really figured out largely on my own because I, I, you know, again, he wasn't a super technical coach and I don't think it was because he wasn't capable. I think he just wasn't that interested. Like right. that wasn't mm-hmm. his thing. Um, yeah. He was a great motivator, a great leader and all that sort of stuff. And that's where he, he, really shined and that's what he liked to do. And so I think that's part of what helped me become a good coach is because I wasn't a phenomenal athlete. I was not yeah. a naturally gifted weightlifter. So I really it's had to figure it out intellectually. Yeah. That's the difference between me and Darren is <laughs> and, and not that because he's one of the smartest defensive players to ever play for the Cowboys. So I'm not that's not what I'm saying. But whereas like I was the guy when I played, it was like, okay, my foot's it's got to hit here. When yeah. I make contact, it's got to be down. Yeah. I, my pad level's got to be here. I got to do this. My hands have to be in this. Like every little detail had to be taken care of because I wasn't good enough to like just do it that yeah. way. And but that, and not say, and again, that's not a it's shot so at you. It's so true, but it's so true because technically, I didn't really think about it technically. I just did it. Yeah. Like yeah. you just reacted and you went ahead. And you look at the coaches in the NFL or in pro sports altogether. You can't, Michael Jordan can't coach. No. He can't because he's not the technician that you would, you know, he's not going to sit there and tell you how the steps are taken. He just, he's just a tremendous athlete. And, and that's really what's yeah. got him there. But you see those that, that have taken their time that have become those technicians that understand the mechanics, the mechanics of things. Yeah. Exactly. Those are the great coaches. Oh, those are the Bill yeah. Belichick's of this world. Yeah. hundred percent. And that's, it's equally true for weightlifting. And, and the, the, the best coaches, 
typically are like mediocre weightlifters. Like you, you can't be a terrible weightlifter. Like yeah, you gotta right. have, you gotta be able to ability. apply some of your coaching to yeah, it. Yeah. You know, but like, so, you know, I competed at the national championship level. Uh, I had a master's American record. And so I was, I was okay. I was good enough to, to have the experience as a, you know, relatively high level competitive lifter and, and understand how everything worked. Um, but I was also not good enough to gloss over all these things that other people needed to learn. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, without that experience of having to figure stuff out, yeah, you don't, you don't know how to communicate it. That's right. I think, uh, you know, these natural athletes and they're like, just, what do you mean? Just, just lifted. Yeah. Yeah. I I think we had a strength coach at, um, at Fresno state. Uh, his name's Moses Cabrera. He's now with the New England Patriots. I don't know if you've ever crossed paths with him at all, but no, I he, recognize the name though. He was so again. He's a five six Hispanic guy, and I mean, really intelligent. Um, like you said, he was a he was a good weightlifter. He was he was strong. He played like D three football somewhere, um, but he was so technically sound. So he would pull like so. We had the head strength coach. And, and so, but Moses would take guys to the side that were really interested in, in re, like proper technique on power cleans, right. proper technique on squat cleans, proper technique. Like there was no straps. There was none of the stuff that all the football players, like we're just jerking 400 pounds yeah. just to get up on the board. Right. It's about, okay. Yeah. How, you know, wearing the proper attire, wearing the right shoes. We're making sure, okay, Hey, we're actually becoming explosive in the hips and not just a, Hey, we're just just jerking this thing. Right. And so Moses took that. And now again, he's the head coach at the new England Patriots from going and being the like third guy in line at Fresno state because of the details, because of the things that you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. And, and that's why that's one of the questions that, that, you know, you're talking about this and you're talking about being a technician. How much passion did you have See, for that the was, sport? That's right. Oh, I, I was obsessed with it. Um, I mean, so, my, uh, the way I met my wife is that she was one of Mike Bergner's athletes. Uh, so she was a national champion weightlifter. Um, and she, she's the opposite of me. She's extremely naturally talented. You know, she, the way she got into weightlifting is she was playing volleyball. She had a college scholarship and she actually didn't go in order to stay and become a weightlifter. And she was a resident at the Olympic training center for a while in, in wow. 2000, I think. But, uh, you know, there's pictures of her just jumping in celebration after a good lift. And, you know, she's 15 feet up in the air. It's, it's just bananas. And I'm like, you know, I got to jump as hard as possible just to reach the top shelf. Uh, so I totally forget where I was going with that. Now yeah, the passion, the passion uh, aspect. Yeah. So early on when we, were, we started dating, like our, our dates half the time were like sitting in my living room, icing our knees, watching weightlifting videos. You know, and, and, uh, you know, that's a Friday night getting ready for Saturday morning training. Man, you, know, you had a game for our big, heavy snatch clean. <laughs> so day. much game. We we're both competitive lifters. Yeah. You know, we're not going to go out drinking and dancing and all that stuff. Yeah. We're sitting there with ice cups on our knees, uh, you know, watching <laughs> the Gatorade ice cups Bulgarians on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it, you know, everything, my whole life was, was built around, the sport. And that's, yeah, I think uh, that's what got me, you know, as it's to, you know, accelerated me as quickly yeah. as it did to, to where I went. And I want to get more into, you know, your journey after you release this book. But one thing that, that I was kind of alluding to in, in, in some of these questions that, that we were kind of teeing up is, is to that passion point yeah. is there's so many high school kids and college kids that are just like, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I think I'm supposed to do something, but yeah. I just, I think of, you know, I'm 36 years old now. And I pursued my passion of playing football and I, and I saw it all the way out, but I just, I see so many kids just, um, just settle because there's, they, they're supposed to do something and they're supposed to, Oh, I'm, I got to get a job. I graduated, but yes, the road may be a little bit longer and it may be a little bit harder, but if you continue to follow truly what you're passionate about, what you're obsessed about, it can turn into it because you never would have known that you would have written the leading book on weightlifting, you know, as a young coach. Right. But the passion propelled you to that. And I just, I think of like things that I'm passionate about, like what would I be passionate enough about to sit down and write a book about? Mm, Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And I just, I think that that's such a powerful thing not to overlook and not to settle just because, 
you know, you're supposed to go to college and you're supposed to get your business degree and then you're supposed to be an accountant or you're supposed to be this, like follow the passion, whatever it is, because there are opportunities and there are gaps. And, you know, weightlifting at the time, it was a, a great opportunity, like you mentioned, right? The technology wasn't out there. The, the you know, all the resources online weren't there because it was at the time. But whatever it is, if you follow that passion, you cannot be wrong, all right? Yeah. Well, I think such a huge part of the problem, especially these days, is that there's this this huge lack of experience with, you know, high school, college age kids where they they are not getting out there into the world and engaging and seeing what's out there to see what they are passionate about. You know, everybody is in this very narrow bandwidth. Everyone looks at the same Instagram memes. Everyone's watching the same Netflix shows. Um, I mean, even the the formerly kind of regionally variable uh you know dialects that we all spoke you know growing up in fresno you're going to talk just a little bit differently from a guy from the bay area who's going to talk differently from the guy from southern california mm-hmm. but now you know my daughter speaks exactly the same as a kid growing up in massachusetts yeah, right because right. it's all online yeah and so i think there's this real lack of of experience where it, these kids aren't getting out into the world and seeing what's out there. So, you know, how are they going to find what they're passionate about? You know, what are you passionate about making memes? Well, yeah. you know, you're not, probably not going to become a millionaire The the barstool sports guy pulled it off somehow, but like, <laughs> you know, out, outside of that, it's, it's not a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Now, how much, how much of this is that you put your ego aside as well? Because look, you're, you're, you're competing at a high level. You're, you're competing against some of the best. And then you, 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 you get to a point to where, Mentally, you make the change of, you know what, maybe this isn't, you know, something that I can scale myself into being a champion. But now understanding of and, and here's the pro, here's the thing that I'm, I'm really the question I really have for you is the humility side of it, because you didn't get to where you wanted to be the champ. Right. I mean, the ultimate goal is always. Be, but now it was having the humility to actually say, OK, I'm not going to be that person. I'm not going to uh, be the champion, but. I can help and serve and stay along the same path because there's so many people that I, I didn't get there. Now I'm just going to quit and walk yeah. away from it because right. Ben, you now and I, I had the same thing. Help others achieve yeah. maybe what I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think there, there's a couple parts to it. And in, in the humility thing is huge because that's what allows you to go attempt things that you're potentially going to be terrible at. Uh-huh. Right. That, that's how you get those new experiences and find what's out there. Um, if you're unwilling to put yourself in a position where you're going to possibly be embarrassed momentarily because you're not the best guy out there, you're missing out on everything. You know, right. you're going to be stuck in that same little, you know, collection of a handful of things that you do every day anyway. Um, and you you develop this sense of confidence that's totally inaccurate because uh-huh you're only testing yourself in the things you're already good at. You're already comfortable in those things. Mm -hmm. Um, But then, yeah, also being willing to recognize like, Hey, you know, I figured out again, early on, I'm not going to the Olympics. I'm not going to go to the world championships and and set world records. Um, But this is what I love doing. And this other aspect of it, I'm very good at. At the same time, though, I recognized I'm still really early on here. You know, I'm an right. infant in terms of, of mm-hmm. coaching development. Um, but instead of saying, well, these guys will never take me seriously. Or There's no way I'm going to get established. How are athletes ever going to trust me? It's like, well, I'm just going to start doing this. And I'm going to put out what I think is good information. I'm going to work with whoever will come to me and work with me. Uh, you know, whoever will trust me. And I'm going to do the best job I possibly can. And you, that's how you develop your ability and your reputation. And you start, you know, if you stay humble throughout that, you're always willing to learn. You're always willing to correct mistakes and listen to other people's advice Mm -hmm. Um, versus, you know, we see in weightlifting a lot now, thanks to social media, a lot of spontaneously materializing coaches, or suddenly there's an Instagram account that says, you know, world-class weightlifting coach. It's like, well, (laughs) who'd you coach? Uh, you know, what do you mean world-class? And it's like, no, what you have is a media team, a good cameraman an editor, um, you know, mm-hmm. and, and some great packaging, but the, the box is empty, right? There's nothing in there. Right. And so much of it now is that all this digital content. It's so easy to just pluck what you want, change a couple things and put it out as your own. So there's yeah. this, uh, lack of need to create new things and be original and, and really, 
um, you know, experiment and learn. It's more just like, Hey, I can just repackage other people's stuff and get a million followers and make a ton of money selling, you know, online programming or whatever. Yeah. It is. That one thing that you hit on though is in the humility aspect is I realized that I was young in the industry and young in, in, in this sport and I needed to learn. I think so quickly, and you talk about it just now, the, the Instagram, it's like so quickly I want it. And we talk about it all the time on yeah. the show. Like, I want it now. I want it now. Well, there's an education that goes into being great. And it takes time to learn. And it takes, it takes failures. Uh, it takes victories. It takes all sorts of things to build the experience to be an expert. You can't be an expert because, like you said, your social media handle says so. And so, yeah. man, that's, that is huge and I, and I just, I think I want to encourage some of these, mm. you know, these younger folks about, listen, like if you want to be the best in something, it never comes overnight. That's right. I mean, yeah. I, look, the Kardashians made a run at that, right? Being the best at whatever, whatever that is, right? No one knows, but I, yeah. I, yeah, we're still <laughs> being best at being ambiguous. But, right. but the, the whole point is, is it, you have to have the humility to say like, I'm going to learn like for me, real estate, like. That is, that is something that like, I knew I had to start over. Like I was, I played yeah. for the Dallas Cowboys and I had to literally start over. I was now side by side with this 22 year old kid that just graduated college that doesn't know anything about real estate. Cause guess what? I didn't know anything about real estate yeah. and, and it's an education aspect. Yes. While building relationships, while building knowledge, while doing all these things, but man, you cannot have it right now. You can work your tail off and accelerate the process but you're not going to bypass the process. Yeah. No. And so much of it, there's this a huge lack of, of work ethic. Uh, I mean, even in my, I'm 41, even my generation, I see people just unwilling to work hard. Even just even do the bare minimum. It's, it's like pulling teeth, getting people to do their jobs. Um, uh, and, and, people fail to recognize that that hard work is not just this like awful thing, this, this terrible thing you have to endure. There are so many rewards that come directly from the hard work, the willingness to work hard. That's, that's where you learn those lessons you're talking about. Um, you know, you can get ahead in a, in an objective sense. If your dad gives you $10 million, well, Hey, I'm a millionaire. Mm -hmm. Yeah but you're not in the sense because you didn't earn any of that. You didn't learn anything along the way. You do not have the ability to do the things that earn $10 million. You, you never learned any of those lessons. Uh, and so that, I, like you said, that idea of wanting to skip immediately to the end, to the best part. Um, yes, you may have these great things, uh, but you're not going to be content. You're not going to be fulfilled. You're not going to be happy because those things in and of themselves are not really meaningful, right? You're, you're, yeah. The meaningful stuff is the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. we're speaking with Greg Everett, uh, uh, world class, and I'm, I'm going to say this, but uh, leading one of the leading uh, strength uh, Olympic lifting coaches nationally here, um, and and author of the book Tough. Um, you you wrote this uh, this Olympic lifting book, uh, 2006. You said. Uh, 2008 was 2008. when it first came out. Okay. Yeah. So 2008, where does that lead? You said you're in the third edition now, but what happens after you release this book, you know, from a career, from a personal standpoint? Uh, shortly after that, that book came out, my wife and I moved from Southern California back to where I was from the Bay area, opened a gym, um, started a, a weightlifting program there, which was still really tough to do at that stage. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't a demand. So, you know, we're, we're training, uh, you know, middle-aged insurance broker guys, you know, who want to learn how to snatch and clean and jerk. I'm not training the next <laughs> Olympic team quite yet. Um, but again, that's what, again, going back to what I just said, that's what people don't understand is you got to start there. Yeah. Right. You, yeah. you got to start with whoever will work with you. And that's where you learn. You, you mm -hmm. make all your mistakes with them. Um, Cause they don't know the difference, right? It's not going to, it's not going to make or break this guy's career if he takes a little longer to learn how to snatch, right? Cause he just turns around and goes and shells and in insurance policies later. Yeah. Um, and so we started building a reputation there as a gym, you know, under the, the term, the name catalyst athletics was the business and um, put out the second edition of the book really shortly after the first, because you know, that, that, early on that training, I learned so much so quickly. And I immediately felt that I had to, to revise so much of what I had put out in that book. 
Um, and so again, it was just really fortunate because of the timing that there wasn't much out there competitively, Mm -hmm. um, with that book that it really just took over. And so that started bringing more people to me. So I had more and more good athletes to coach. Uh, you know, we actually built up a team and in the, the, the very first competition we did where we entered a team was the American open and we took silver. Mm. Uh, oh. our women's team. So it was like we right out of the gate, we were drawing really good athletes and, and you know, doing a good job. And, and so that really helps. Obviously, that's ultimately how you judge a weightlifting coach is, well, who do you coach and how good are they? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're producing athletes, we're producing a really recognizable team. And at the same time, I'm putting out all this instructional content that's helping a ton of other coaches get started and develop their programs and, and athletes who don't have coaches. You know, I would, there were so many times I would be out of national championships and people in the warm up room would come up to me and say, Hey, um, I, you know, I qualify for my first national championships this year and I've never had a coach. I've just used all your material. What was that uh, feeling so, like? Stop right there. What was that feeling like the first time? You oh, heard it's, un- that? it's unreal. Where you, that's where you really recognize like, hey, all this stuff I'm, you know, I'm banging out by myself in this, this office, uh, you know, pulling my hair out with stress. Like it's actually getting out there and it's actually helping people. And that's, uh-huh. uh, it's, it's one thing to produce something and be like, yeah, I think this is good. But to have that actually proven yeah. uh, and to get that feedback where people are, are, you know, are really grateful for it because they, they, there's no coach within 500 miles. You know, they just yeah. don't have an option. That's awesome. Uh and so, you know, the running joke with me has always been like, you know, I don't even know how many weightlifters have qualified for the national championship because I don't even know them all. <laughs> right. Um, and there, there was actually a, a really talented, he's still lifting guy named Harrison Morris, phenomenal weightlifter. Um, but I was at the, the Pan Am championships in Miami a few years ago, I was sitting at the bar in between, you know, one of the nights and uh, his coach was like, Hey, you know, I just wanted to thank you. Like your book is how I basically learned how to coach. And without that, I wouldn't have known how to get Harrison started. Uh, so so then I go, yeah, I I started Harrison Morris. (laughs) Of course it's not true. You know, Kevin Simmons gets the credit for it, but it was like that, like you said, the feeling of that is awesome. Like that's an incredibly rewarding thing to recognize that the stuff that you've worked so hard to do Mm -hmm. and that you've, you've risked, the rejection and the embarrassment, like if it's not good and it doesn't work, you're you're still willing to put that out there and, you know, uh, stick your neck out. Then that is a huge relief. It's such a, such a big, so gratifying of an experience. So question is that bar in Miami, did you ask for his address so you could send an invoice? (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, I I wish. (laughs) So, so talk to somebody who is starting something Uh, because you mentioned you know, we, we hear these terms like, you know, you got to work hard and, and you got to show up every day. And, and those terms get thrown out there. And we just, and to me, yeah, we just lose, they lose their meaning. So yeah. from a practical standpoint, talk us through what somebody can do when they're first starting out. What things should they focus on? You talked about passion earlier, and it's got to be something you're passionate about. I'm guessing you understood why you wanted to do all this. Talk to us a little bit about what advice you would give somebody who's starting something. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. So I think the key is to, to really have in mind, first and foremost, like you said, why, you know, understanding that, that true underlying motivation, what is, why am I feeling compelled to do this? What is, what do I believe this is going to give me, uh, you know, during the process at the end of the road, whatever, create these ultimate uh, you know, practical objectives, these big long-term goals, whether it's five years, 10 years, 15 years, a lifetime, whatever, but then you need to work backward and you need to break those things up into more manageable pieces. Cause nobody can go day to day with a 15 year plan as their only mm-hmm. landmark. Right. It just mm-hmm. doesn't work because that path is not linear. Um, there's, you're going to run into unexpected obstacles, all kinds of unpredictable things that are going to push you off the path. So if you don't have, you know, waypoints along the way to that final landmark, it's very easy to get knocked off track. And even if your motivation for that big thing still exists, it's easy to lose enthusiasm for it along the way. Cause you know, you got the pressures of work, school, family obligations, whatever, uh, you know, your dog is sick. It doesn't matter what it is. It's if you don't have that true understanding of the motivation, 
but then step by step things that you can check off along the way. Mm. Um, and not only that, but each one of those individual steps is a chance for accomplishment, which means you are stoking your enthusiasm continually um, rather than feeling, you know, I just got to grind away for 10 years with with no rewards and just being miserable. And then finally I'll reach this thing. So it's really working back and, and creating those step-by-step -step things. And then along with that is creating habits and routines that are conducive to pursuing whatever it is you're pursuing. Mm -hmm. You you have to create a lifestyle that allows those things to happen so that you're not constantly trying to swim upstream. Um, and, and so many of us, we go through life just purely based on inertia. We just do what we do because that's what we've always done. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what our spouse does, or that's what our right. parents do, or that's what our siblings do. And it, it, we, it, it, we turn it into this daily fight and it makes it infinitely more difficult and frustrating and discouraging. Um, so if, if you find ways where you can say, okay, what are, what are my daily obstacles to achieving these short-term goals? Now, how do I change things uh, to move those out of the way or, or to allow me to get past them more easily and with less effort, less kind of cognitive strains. So you're not having to, to think your way through everything versus I get up, I make my coffee, I go do my morning journal routine, figure out what I'm up to, um, you know, go over yesterday's stuff and what do I need to change? What did I do well? Am I on track? And then you go and you boom, 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 you just knock out A through Z and now you're continually moving on that path um, versus having to just make it a, a fight all day long, every day. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, man, that's awesome. So how, how many times, and you said you for 16 years you've been writing, is it the newsletter that, you, that you're writing right now? You yeah, the, yeah, the, the performance menu journal. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so for 16 years, how many times have you wanted to quit? Uh, well, let's see, we do monthly issues. So about 12 times a year since 2005. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you know, thank, thankfully a number of years ago, I brought on, uh, an editor who handles all the, uh, you know, bringing in new writers and new, new material. So mostly all I have to do month to month now is I do my one article, mm -hmm. um, and kind of go over, do final checks before it goes out. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it yeah. gets old. Yeah. That's uh Fresno state and Chico state are similar. They don't really like promote enthusiasm about, uh, <laughs> journalism. <laughs> they yeah. don't really like writing much. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I'm curious. I was an English major too. And I still don't. Like oh. that much. <laughs> so I'm curious the element of, you know, cause we hear again, pursue your passion, pursue what you're interested in, but it can't be 100%. I love everything I do. No. Yeah. So how do you work through that? Encourage somebody who thinks maybe they're doing something today they're not really in love with. And they think, okay, if I go, you know, the grass is always green. If I go pursue this, it's just going to be, you know, awesome all the time. So encourage that person who maybe thinks, you know, that, that there's never going to be a bad day if I pursue what I'm really after. Yeah. That, that whole, uh, do what you love. You'll never work a day in your life. Uh, I like that in principle, but it is not true. It's exactly what you said. There, there's there's going to be days when you hate it um, and not because you hate what you're doing, but it's difficult. You know, it's, yeah. it's very difficult to, to do these things, to do anything at a very high level and achieve great things takes a lot of difficult work and there's setbacks and there's, you're, you're taking unexpected left turns here and there, but it goes back to what I said earlier about tying everything you're doing to that ultimate underlying motivation, which really means tying it to your values. Mm -hmm. Who are you to truly? What is your identity? What is most meaningful and significant to you? Um, because that is what dictates our decisions, or at least what our decisions should be. And if what we're doing day to day is harmonious with those things, then long term and on average, we will be happy and content with what we're doing, even if on a small scale, maybe, hey, you know, the first half of Monday, I was hating the entire world and I wanted to quit everything uh, because I had all these problems with what I was doing, but I stuck with it. I figured it out and I kept going because I remembered that the reason I'm doing this is because it's going to, you know, give me this feeling at the end of the day, I'm going to not just feel satisfied with the fact that I got through difficult stuff and was able to do hard work, which in and of itself is rewarding and gratifying, but it's serving this greater purpose long-term. And so that, that, you know, always being able to, to tr come back to that, 
why am I doing this? And if you, because yeah. if you can't answer that question during yeah. those difficult times, that is exactly when you start looking on the other side of the fence at the greener grass. That yeah. turns out, of mm-hmm. course, to not even be grass. It's like astroturf that's got holes yeah. in it. Yeah. <laughs> so what is it for you then? What is your why? Why do you want to be known as the world's leading expert on, on weightlifting? God, I was hoping you didn't ask that. <laughs> uh, no. I have uh, no idea what my why is. <laughs> I think, well, you know, like, like Darren has said multiple times, um, that idea of serving other people has always been a, a, a big part of my um, motivation for a lot of what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, so any kind of coaching, teaching, you know, mentoring, you know, providing information for that helps people, that that's what really... Um, is most rewarding to me. And so any time that I am just driving myself crazy, you know, if I'm stuck at a computer for 12 hours on a certain day and which I, I hate it, uh, yeah. I, I remember like, Hey, this stuff is, is going out to so many people and I get messages and emails constantly. Like, thank you so much. This helped me through this. And, um, when I remind myself of that, why I'm doing it and the fact that I, you know, I'm sitting in my house in this amazing office. Uh, you know, I can look out the windows down over a cliff at a river and, um, I wouldn't be here had I not dedicated myself to doing what I do. So I, I have this great, um, situation where I'm, I'm helping people, which in and of itself, I think is something that Mm -hmm. we should all appreciate. (laughs) Uh, but for me in particular, that is really one of my major underlying values and motivations, but also it's, it's provided me incidentally with all this great stuff, this wonderful lifestyle. I can support my family and, and um, you know, live in this great place and, and enjoy so many pieces of life rather than, you know, being in a job that's making me miserable just to pay the bills. Mm. So walk us through the move back to the Bay area up until you moved up to Oregon and, and wrote the book tough. So fill fill in that so, last gap. Yeah. So gym business was, you know, continuing to grow and, and, you know, one of the things for people who've never owned a gym, it is not as cool as you think it is, right? It is, everyone's like, oh yeah, it's all, you live in a gym, you get to train all day. No, you don't. You get to clean bathrooms, order more paper towels, uh, pay bills primarily. And we're in the San Francisco Bay area. So oh, real estate, geez. not cheap. Forget it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to, at, at the end of our run there, we were paying 10 grand a month just in rent. Mm-hmm. So that's not including cams, insurance, yeah. you know, utilities, all that stuff. Uh, and so it, it really what owning a gym business is, is just constantly marketing, getting new clients. And I, there's nothing I hate more. I hate promoting, especially myself. I hate marketing. Any of that stuff just drives me nuts. Um, and so we got to a point, my wife and I, where we recognized, hey, we are well enough established at this point, you know, with our reputations, um, our accomplishments, and really the income of the business was through the material I was producing, you know, mm-hmm. the books, video, online stuff, my seminars, that's where our money was coming from. The gym was was turning into more of a burden at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and initially it was something we had to do because I had to have a place to coach weightlifting, right. you know, it, th- this remote coaching thing wasn't really a, an option back then. Uh, and so we just, I mean, pr- pretty much looked at each other one day and like, we got to get out of here. Let's go look for something. And it's basically anything, you know, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana had to be West coast. I can't do anywhere else. Uh, and it was like, well, let's get some property. Let's be out there in the middle of nowhere. We can do things remotely. We'll build out our, our big garage as a gym. We can have training camps, whatever. And so that's what we did. And it was tough because, you know, I loved the clients there. They're great people. You don't, you, you feel like you're letting them down. And you know, mm. I had people crying when I told them, I was like, Oh man, you guys are killing me. Uh, <laughs> but it's worked out really well. And so I only have one weightlifter who's local now. She trains here, um, you know, in, in the garage gym, we have a big 1700 square foot garage that's leveled and it's totally outfitted as a, a weightlifting gym. And then all my other lifters and my wife coaches a lot of lifters. It's all remote. And so like they come out here for a week at a time, you know, for training camps, which is great. They get to hang out with each other and motivate each other and um, get a break from wherever they live. And uh, so that, I mean, that's where we are now is just continuing with the content, continuing doing all the things I was doing before, but, you know, finding ways to access more people 
um, at a, at a lower barrier to entry. So, you know, like I don't do private clients anymore cause that's, you know, 300 bucks a month. I would charge for that. That's a very limited demographic of people who can afford that. Yeah. Um, and so now I'm finding ways to, to scale that. And you know, I've got these online teams where I'm 25, 30 bucks a month and I can have hundreds wow. of athletes, wow. but I can still interact with them day to day, give them some feedback, obviously not as much as I would give a, an individual athlete, but it's stuff that they can't get anywhere else. And, you know, pretty much anyone can afford 25 bucks a month. Right. Uh, if you can afford a barbell, you know, you can afford 25 bucks a month. Right. right. That's right. So take us into, so now you're, now you're in Oregon um, and you've got this great house, great land. Uh, what did that free you up to do from, you know, from a, uh, con I mean, I know obviously you're putting out more content and creative thinking, but what did that, did that allow you to say, okay, Hey, now I've got the time and the ability to write a book. I mean, what was this next book? What was the thought process behind that? I definitely did not have the time. I just did it anyway. Okay. Uh, <laughs> which is my, my time management, uh, method is basically just do more stuff anyway. Uh, there's not a whole lot yeah. of like, thinking behind it and planning. Uh, just figure it out. And so fortunately, I'm, I'm good at working quickly. But uh, it, it, I have notes for this book dating back on my computer to 2011. So this is something I've been thinking about doing for a long time. But, you know, those early notes was a little different. And I, I never pursued it because it wasn't quite – it was this really half-baked sort of thing. And I think if I had written it back then, it would have come off like – you know, a, a somewhat disappointed father wagging his finger at his kid, like, mm -hmm. you know, rub some dirt in it, walk it off sort of, sort of thing, uh, which was not what I wanted it to be. And so thankfully I waited and I don't, there was never some like sudden epiphany that I had. It was like, okay, now I'm ready. It was kind of like, I got to start working on this book. And it was really more the process of writing it that really got me to figure the rest of it out. So mm -hmm. for me, that's part of, of understanding things is trying to communicate it to other people um, because that's what helps me really flesh out ideas and, and form them the rest of the way. So I, you know, the writing process itself of that book was really instructive for me. Uh, that helped me figure out a lot of these ideas more clearly mm -hmm. uh, and implement them in my own life, uh, which of course is, selfishly is, you know, part of the goal with this stuff is, yeah. I, you know, I want to get better too. Yeah. yeah. So why toughness? Why was that the topic of, of this book? To be honest, the title, it was a dilemma because I didn't know if that was the right word. Um, and actually the, the original publisher that offered me the deal was like, yeah, we're going to change this title, which was, was step one in, in the cascading series of events which made me turn the contract down. But, uh, that to me, you know, we talked about earlier, me growing up, the way I looked at things, that was such an important quality to me is, is, is having that toughness mentally, physically, emotionally, being able to withstand whatever came your way, work your way through it, get to where you were going. Um, but at the same time, I felt that the way that it was understood popularly, you know, by consensus just wasn't, wasn't quite right. There was something amiss about the idea and there was too much variation on what people thought about it. You know, to one person, toughness was very much a mental thing for another person. It was very much a physical thing mm -hmm. for someone else. It represented, you know, violence and aggression and bravado and, and, you know, the loud mouth in the bar sort of thing. And so I really wanted to refine that and, and put together something that explained exactly what my belief was what is toughness and you know why why do we need it and that is really simply because that is what allows us to pursue what's meaningful to us in life and to engage with the world and other people um in a, a meaningful way and to find that sense of fulfillment so you know that the subtitle you read earlier is like an entire sentence but it's like I, because i felt like i had to explain the tough part uh, enough that someone would actually pick up that book. You know, someone's yeah. like, well, I'm not trying to get through Bud, so I don't need a book called Tough. And it's like, well, wait, wait, wait. It's it's more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay, so Greg's been so generous uh, in offering to read us the book. So go ahead and get comfortable. And, uh, <laughs> and Greg's going to start on, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that audio book is eight and a half hours long. So oh, I hope you man. guys got some water and went well, to the bathroom. It's, it, it's good because uh, I actually just downloaded it. So that's that's my new car. I've got a 45-minute commute each way. So uh, oh, I should be done with it next week. So, uh, yeah. but, uh, 
So what's next? What's next for for Greg? What's next for the sport of weightlifting? What what, what do you see the trajectory of this of this sport and where it's gone recently? Recently, obviously, with with cross the CrossFit Games taken off, right? There's an awareness like it's become a more popular sport. Uh, but what have you? Where do you see this going over the next five to ten years? Weightling, weightlifting right now is actually in a really uh, rough patch. So mm-hmm. the basically the International Olympic Committee um, keeps slapping the International Weightlifting Federation for the drug problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the U.S. Uh, with USADA, the drug testing for weightlifting is extremely strict. Like we, some of our lifters on our team um, get tested, you know, 30 plus times a year. Wow. Um, it Not just in competition. This is random out of test competition. So they will, USADA shows up at your door at six in the morning and makes you pee in a cup. We know that. We um, know that feeling. feeling yeah. I've been on vacation yeah. in South Lake Tahoe and dude shows yep. up. Yeah. Dude, Yep. Hey, yeah, go ahead and piss in this cup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so it's, you know, on our end, we, we are doing a very good job as, as a federation of keeping the sport clean. Yes. Mm-hmm. Some people can get by, but it's very difficult to do. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas internationally, a lot of the dominant countries do not have that policy. And so mm-hmm. repeatedly, you know, the, the, the IOC went back and retested weightlifters from the 2008 and 2012 Olympics and popped a bunch of like dozens of people who passed originally. Wow. And so you saw medals go boom, 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 and like drop down the podium. And all of a sudden the sixth place winner had a gold medal in, a, mm. in some cases. Um, and it's like, there's this intransigence where these countries just refuse to stop doing what they're doing because they've been doing it for decades. That's what allows them to be so dominant. And so there is a real threat that the sport will not be an Olympic sport in the future. Um, if, if it, you know, major changes aren't made. So that's, that's the bad news is that a lot of us over here are, are really freaking out about that. And, you know, what, what's the sport going to be if it's not in the Olympics, is it going to splinter off into, you know, 80 different federations like powerlifting. And now, you know, one weight class has 20 different world champions. Cause it's just all yeah. kind of independent. Right. And it really loses a lot of the, the prestige. But the good news is that, like you said, with CrossFit in particular, the recognition is out there. There are so many people finding the sport for the first time, learning about it, um, you know, just becoming totally enamored with it. And it's amazing. Like you, you see, uh, you know, like a 55 year old woman who's never been an athlete in her life. Now she's doing weightlifting and she loves it. Like it gives her this, this sense of pride, this sense of accomplishment, this, this, it's this very empowering thing. Um, so that's wonderful. I mean, that's great to see. And I don't think that's going to change regardless of what happens to the sport, you know, in a, in a competitive sense, cause those people aren't competing. They're doing it cause it's a, a right. personally satisfying thing. Right. Um, and so that's the good news. So I, I do think it's going to continue to grow, um, which is great because for people like me, I don't have to go back and get a real job, um, <laughs> you know, and for other, you know, upcoming coaches and former athletes, it's giving them more and more avenues uh, for careers, you know, whereas like you're talking about, you finished the NFL. Well, now you got to go do real estate. I, years ago, before I was married, I dated a girl who was a two-time Olympic, uh, downhill skier, dental hygienist, you know? So it's like you, you completely change gears and have to pursue something totally different. Whereas, you know, now in weightlifting, a lot of people can stay in the sport in one form or another and keep doing the thing they love doing, just, you know, not as an athlete anymore. Yeah. And you know, what I see a lot of the value also is just the technical aspect of it. Yeah. Just, as the high school kid that's in the in the gym and he's, you know, hang cleaning, never like I have a 20 year old son in high school a few years ago. He's asking me how to yeah. do a, a hand clean. I'm like, dude, I can't help you. Call B- Uncle Ben. <laughs> ben yeah. knows better than I do. But, you know, just finding you is, is one thing that we need to fi- figure out a way to, you know, push, you know, p- let's start pushing people towards you, young kids towards you to, to learn how to actually, you know, weight train the proper way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, well and, it's great because now so many high school coaches who have a bad rap, you know, teaching horrible power. Yes. Cleaning, you know, kids are, are landed in the splits and, you know, yep. bending over backwards. So many more wait, 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 of them now bad. are setting their <laughs> ego aside yeah. and, you know, willing to go learn from people outside of the sport. And so that's yeah. propelling 
you know, the kids performances, their safety, their enjoyment of it all. And, yeah. and uh, you know, again, look at a guy like Matt Frazier, you know, had his coach not and, and, you know, dad not been willing to kind of look into that stuff. He wouldn't have been a great weightlifter and then turned out to be the best crossfitter of all time. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Yeah, well, I think of, you know, the ancillary benefits of pursuing something like weightlifting beyond the actual physical movement of weightlifting. You know, I've, I've got my son in jujitsu. I don't know anything about jujitsu. And, and yeah, the technical skill of jujitsu, that's awesome. But I've got him in there to learn discipline and respect yeah. and listening to authority and things like that. So weightlifting is kind of the same vein of there's, it's so technical. You have to apply yourself in a different way than you do any other aspect mm -hmm. of your day-to-day -day right. life. It requires yeah. so much attention to detail. And I think that can carry over over to anything. So, yes, I, I I hope I'm with you. I hope it's a sport that continues to grow, and that people who may not otherwise have anything to do with it are just because of those other ancillary benefits. Hundred percent. And I mean, you guys know as well as anybody. You know, anyone who's been involved in a sport, uh, especially at a high level, but really at any level. You, you develop so many qualities that do carry on later in life, that, that sense of discipline, that work ethic, uh, you know, knowing how to interact with other people, yeah. oh. <laughs> uh, you know, which so many kids have so much difficulty with. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you can have that experience, even relatively briefly growing up, you end up being a much better, more productive, more contributive adult. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the more of that happens, the more it snowballs and more and more parents are, are pushing their kids to become involved in sports. And mm -hmm. it's much easier to, you know, your kids don't want to listen to you. Right. <laughs> but they probably will listen to a coach Absolutely. or teammates, yes. you know, and so you just got to find the ones who are telling them the stuff that you want them to be told. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a challenge. So, so we, we've got a, or Tyler, do you have something? Yeah, else? I was just going to I was just going to say, Greg, I, for, for the listeners and, and those that are watching on YouTube, how can how can they connect with you? And, and I want to encourage specifically and you just mentioned it, coaches, any any high school uh, collegiate coach yeah. that just wants, you know, wants some, some more help on being able to relay proper technique, proper, um, proper programming, all of those things. How can they find you? What's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, catalystathletics.com uh, is is the website, and that will have that's the portal to everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have a YouTube channel, of course, Instagram um, at Catalyst Athletics. But so that that website has literally thousands of videos, uh, a few hundred articles, an entire exercise library with video demos. I mean, pretty much everything you could possibly need to learn and teach these things you can get for free. Oh. And then, of course, there's some books um, specifically for, you know, non weightlifter athletes. I wrote a book uh, years back called Olympic Weightlifting for Sports. And that's, you know, my kind of pared down, simplified teaching progressions for the lifts you know, for people who are not intending to, you know, dedicate their lives to snatch and clean and jerk. It's like, well, how do I learn, you know, snatch clean jerk variations for football or for wrestling or whatever right. it is. And so yeah. that's a really good one for coaches. Cause that, you know, you guys know you got 45 minutes with some kids, you know, a few days a week and you're not going to yeah. be, be teaching them these things at, at that 40 of them at a maximal time. level. Yeah, so right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's actually amazing that coaches are <laughs> your typical coach is allowed to teach weightlifting. It's, yeah. it's pretty scary. Yeah. What think about have. the liability that <laughs> yeah. is, you know, but think, well, not, it's not just at that <laughs> level, but just think about where we can, where I came from, you know, I'm 51 years old. So how things have progressed over the years. Like I remember going way past on, on the bench press, going way past, you know, where I'm supposed to be going. My shoulders are blown out. Yeah. Most of my injuries way I've past had your chest. <laughs> I've had 12. <laughs> yeah, he's going all the way to his back. Yeah. <laughs> but I've had 12 surgeries. And I can tell you, man, most of those surgeries is because I wasn't lifting properly. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't uh, two, two back surgeries, L4, L5. One of them came from hand cleans. And I just, and we weren't taught properly how to go what, about our business at the highest level. What mattered is what number went up on the board for yeah. everyone to see. I Absolutely. know that's what my college, my early college strength coach, that's all you cared about, right? Is because yeah. his success was measured by what numbers were put up on the board. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You, 
you clean 400 pounds, but how disgusting did that form look? And does that actually translate to power on the football field? Right. I think I do think that at least from my perspective is that the and I and I say industry, but you know the the weightlifting world, the strength training world is actually understanding the importance of movement and that and how certain technique and, and movement, you know, how you are moving actually translates to power, right? So it's not necessarily yeah. if you're doing, you know, a, a 315 clean as opposed that's really good, really explosive and done correctly, that translates better than a 405 yeah. hang clean with straps and splitting and, you know, you twist Just your way up. and off your thighs. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And that's how yeah, I got, that's that's how I got on the wall. too because the, the sport of weightlifting has one of the lowest rates of injuries of any Olympic sport. It's actually oh, like wow. a very low injury sport. But then you put it in that situation yeah. where it's not being taught properly. Yep. And you got, you know, you got a gym with 50 kids in one mm-hmm. poor coach who's just like pulling his hair out, trying to wrangle them yeah. like wet cats. Uh, that's, you know, like you said, Darren, that's how you get a bunch of unnecessary injuries yeah. instead of focusing on movements. Um, yeah. Yeah, you guys probably know who Joe Ken is, but, you know, his his whole approach is like, why are we teaching kids how to clean when they can't do a push up? Mm-hmm. You know, let's let's yeah. build that foundation yeah. first. Yeah. Um, and we're, we can get to these things, but if they can't even control the basics, you know, why are we loading up the bar just that's to get that, on yes. the board? Yeah, yeah that's okay. right. Well, man, I, I, this has been awesome. Uh, you know, personally, I, I have a fitness background, so it's been great to I've followed Catalyst Athletics for a long time now. So personally, it's been fun to get to know you and, and learn a little bit more. You stole uh, all your material, man. Just want to let you know. I was going to say, everyone does. <laughs> Thank, you. Uh, Thank you, brother. <laughs> by, by, Ben's, by Ben's fitness background, he has an Instagram page that, that he does uh, sit-ups and burpees <laughs> with, with cats and dogs running around. He's that nice. the at-home workouts. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> But our uh, dad bod. Yeah, yes, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So our final question we'd like to ask every guest is, is this, if you could go back to any point in your life and tell yourself one thing, doesn't necessarily mean you go change anything, but if you go back and just tell yourself one thing, where do you go and what do you tell yourself? I, I would probably go back to my very early teenage years and tell myself to quit caring about what anybody was thinking about me. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's so easy to see that now as an adult, like, you know, how, how you blow things like that out of proportion as a kid. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the most critical thing ever is, you know, these guys over here think I look funnier or I'm not strong enough or whatever it is. And if you get past that and you just focus on what's important to you and pursuing that, you will just blow everybody's doors off Mm -hmm. and you, you are essentially unstoppable at that point. So that would be the advice and hopefully I'd be able to take it. But yeah. Yeah. see, that's the crazy thing about it is, is so many of us in that are adults now felt that like, I mean, I remember anytime anybody like brushed their nose, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I got a huge booger in my nose. Everybody's <laughs> yeah. staring at me. Like that's the initial reaction. Right. And so many yeah. of us cared so much about it. But the funny part is like you mentioned, right. They may not listen to dad, but they'll listen to coach. I just, yeah. I just hope that if we have any, teenagers, uh, young adolescents listening, hear this advice, hear what Greg's saying, because literally if we could tell ourselves, our 15 year old selves, you just heard Greg say that to himself. If we could say that, that's the advice that we would give of all the things that we learn. That's the advice that we give. So hopefully someone can hear that and actually take, take it to heart. Yeah, that is life changing right there. I wish I could go back and do that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Greg, thank you well, so hey, look much. How great, I turned out. Anyway. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm working on. I'm gonna start working on my beard, so I need whatever beard oil you got going. Because <laughs> yeah, if you're not watching on YouTube, go check it out. The beard, think, the beard is worth it's, it. It's for real. real. It's a proprietary blend of like spit, <laughs> snot, and diet coke. There it is. Diet there coke. it is. <laughs> I think that's like. I mean, you're on track to to be you know on pace with the Sorenex guys. Those, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I won't be that strong though. Those guys are monsters. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, hey, very much appreciate you taking yeah. the time and talking with us today, and uh, and make sure to check him out uh, on CatalystAthletics.com uh, and and find him. And the book Tough uh, is available. Plug that real anywhere. quick. Anywhere, yeah. anywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Audiobooks, any ebook, and audiobooks. So okay. wherever you buy books, you can get it. Yeah, All right, awesome. hey Greg, man, really appreciate your time, man. And uh, we're oh, gonna thank have, you guys very much for having yeah. me. We're gonna push followers your way, man. Kids, coaches, everyone your way. This is great. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks a lot, man. Right, have you a good guys one. Take care. All right. All right.
Bye. Thank you.